Today on The Grave Talks, a conversation about the hauntings of Port Gamble, Washington, with Paranormal Pete. Port Gamble Uh, is known as a charming little town, and by little, I mean very little, like 75 people. It's a beautiful area, and it's on the Kitsap Peninsula, situated on the shores of Scenic Hood Canal. But it's also known as one of the most haunted towns in the state of Washington. It's a place where history comes alive, literally. If you want a paranormal experience, chances are you'll find it in Port Gamble. There are many spooky locations in this tiny town, including the most haunted residence in town, the Walker Ames House. I'm Carol Hughes, and on this episode of The Grave Talks, we'll talk about the hauntings of Port Gamble, Washington, with Pete Orbea, also known as Paranormal Pete, with Port Gamble Paranormal. And Pete, thanks so much for joining me tonight. Thanks, Carol. Really appreciate uh, the opportunity to come on and talk to you. This is an interesting little town. It's a beautiful town, but it is little. And it's so interesting to me that they call it one of the most haunted towns in the state of Washington, but it's so tiny. Right. It's Yeah, it's one of the smallest towns you'll find, at least in western Washington. But uh, it's also one of the oldest towns in Washington, and it was established in 1853. And just to give you an idea of the years of the buildings we have out here, uh, the oldest building is 1859, and the newest home is 1919. The newest and, home is 1919. Yes. Wow. <laughs> yeah, there. It's a national historic landmark district, and it was a sawmill town started by these gentlemen Pope and Talbot from Maine, from East Machias, Maine, and. It's still, when you come here, you take a step back in time. The buildings we have left, we preserve, we work hard to maintain them and and keep them up. And so it's like we're literally stepping back in time. And I think that's part of the reason people never left. (laughs) I think it's just, it's still being used. So it's very interesting. So by many spooky locations, it doesn't seem like there could be many with only... 75 residents, but there's quite a few buildings still in the town. Yeah. So during the town's peak, um, you know, late 1880s to 1900, the top population here was about 900. So it was a lot more active back then uh, when the sawmill was, you know, it kind of in its heyday. Um, And there were about 400 buildings here historically. And today what's left is about 50. So we're lucky to have those, (laughs) but there used to be a lot more smaller houses, um, cabin type structures, things like that. But uh, we have about 50 buildings left. Let's talk about your background a little bit. You have the Port Gamble Paranormal. Mm -hmm. Do do you run that? Yes. Uh, Something I started as a part of my job um, with the company that owns Port Gamble. So maybe I'll back that up. And just oh, say I was going to say, owned. let's go back it's, to that. <laughs> it's a company owned town. And it was um, the one company from 1853 to 2020. And then in May of 2020, that company was bought out by another timber company. It's a unique situation being in uh, a company owned town. Did you say eight, it was owned by one company from 1853 to 2020? Yep. Wow. Yep. So I worked for the former company. And then when we were bought out now, I work for the new company, you know, even with very little people we have now, it's, I think just the history still sticks around here. So yeah, it's, it's a unique situation for sure. Being a company owned town, I don't know of any company-owned towns. There aren't any around where I live anyway. But don't you suppose if the people work in for the company, mm-hmm. the company owns the town, it's kind mm-hmm. of their whole life is this company. So I could yeah. see how spirits would really stick around because they're that connected. Yeah. That makes I sense. Think, I think that's a great thought in a, in a, in a good path of – of thinking when you're approaching the paranormal here. Yeah, there's there's a lot of reasons, but back then, you know, it was the company, it was everything. That's where you got your food. That's where you right. got everything you needed to survive. Your, your house. Pay, 
your house. Yeah. And so, yeah, I could see that being something that, you know, being that the company was really everything in your life, you might stick around. I've lived here since 2007 and I'm, I joke around that I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm going to haunt Port Gamble someday <laughs> <laughs> when I die. Why not join gonna, them? It's kind of a party there. Right. Yeah. And I can say, hey, to all the people I've talked to over the years. So when did you start Port Gamble Paranormal? Yeah. Oh, so I was saying that um, as a part of our company, the town manager at the time was started doing ghost walks. And then um, so I took that over around 2011. And then we kind of did a sub brand of the town, Port Gamble Paranormal. And then in 2016, um, the company gave me the opportunity to make it my own business. And so in 2016, it became my own business. And I've been doing doing that ever since. So even the company was involved <laughs> with yeah. the paranormal. They really yes. have their hands in everything, don't they? They, yeah. And it's it's a part of the town. It's it's the town's known for being haunted and. And it's kind of an eclectic town, you know, just in general. And so, you know, the company was like, well, let's, you know, early on, let's do a conference uh, and bring people together and, you know, get people out here to Port Gamble to check it out. And it just kind of just grew from there. Now, most people I know that have an interest in the paranormal, especially the level that you have, because you do the ghost tours, you do investigations. Mm -hmm. It didn't just start because you started working for this company, is my guess. No. My guess no. is that your interest in the paranormal with so many of us, it started when we were very young. Is that your case as well? Yes. Um, I've always had an interest in um, what's out there that we can't see. There's more to everything than we know. Um I grew up in a very science fiction fan house. And so it was very much, you know, having an open mind to uh, things being out there that we don't know about. But uh, my earliest memory is pretty, a really impactful one for my first experience with the paranormal. I was about seven years old and I was driving through Northern Arizona with my grandparents and uh, I grew up in Boise, Idaho. In the summers, I would go down, spend some of the summertime with my grandparents in Sedona, Arizona. So on one of those trips, we're driving down, and all of a sudden, these two Native American men appeared in the highway in front of us. And it was just like a straight highway, nothing on the sides of the roads. And these uh, two Native American gentlemen, just uh, older guys, uh, appeared and with their backs to us. And my grandpa hit the brakes and they turned in towards each other and looked back at me and my grandpa. And he was, you know, on the brakes trying to stop. And then as soon as we got near him, they just vanished. They just disappeared. What? And yeah. And then. So you my both grandpa saw kinda, it. Yeah. That was the part. Even at seven years old, my stomach sank when my grandpa looked at me. Because he didn't say anything up to this point. He's trying to he recover from slamming the brakes on. And he recovers and he looks at me and says, uh, you know, this was a different generation. He says, did you see the old Indians in the road? And I said, yeah. And, he, and my grandmother was sleeping. And then he says, uh, well, don't tell your grandmother. She'll get scared. <laughs> <laughs> but he, that's when I knew he saw what I saw. And we were looking in the mirrors. There was nobody anywhere. So that was at age seven, and that kind of really, I think, in a way, piqued my interest, although I didn't quite understand what, what it right. was, really. And then it seemed like everywhere I worked at in high school and college was haunted nearly everywhere, and just having daily experiences, like every day I'm at work having paranormal experiences uh, kept my interest. And then it wasn't until I moved to Port Gamble and started hearing about all the stuff here that I was like, wow. Oh, and I can study this stuff now. <laughs> we can research this. You know, that was, you know, 2007 to 2010. And yeah. That's and you live in a haunted house now. Well, mm -hmm. maybe a lot of people in Port Gamble do. Maybe that's not unusual there. It is not unusual. And here in, in Port Gamble, there's, reports of the paranormal going back to the 1950s which 
is amazing to me that people were talking about it in the 50s, enough to share it with somebody in the company or to have it written down somewhere, their experience. So it's a long history of it here, not just, you know, like you were saying earlier, not just because I showed up and started doing things right. that there was paranormal stuff. <laughs> I just think so it's, it goes, goes back. Yeah. I think it's so interesting that the company is even interested in the paranormal. Yeah, I don't know how interested the new company is. The old one was anyway. But they're into it. They're, you know, they're supportive of our ghost conference and and what what it does for the community and brings, you know, it brings people to town all year long, the paranormal stuff. Do you do quite a few investigations? Yeah. So for my public investigations from November to April, it's once a month. And then I have a tour once a month. Um, and then in October, I do, I'm do. i doing tours every Friday and Saturday night and Halloween, of course, because right. the ghosts only come out in October, right? Right. <laughs> and at night. <laughs> Nothing yeah. paranormal night. ever happens during the day. Right. The reason I even found you online, I came across the Walker Ames house, and I got to reading about it, and I was really interested in it, and I couldn't find you know, somebody who was doing a ghost tour of it. I couldn't find anyone to talk to. So then I thought, well, there's a paranormal investigator who's been in there. So that's how I came to you. And nice. <laughs> that's how I found you. And so I reached out to you to see if you would come on and talk about the Walker Ames house. But we're also going to talk about several other places in Port mm -hmm. Gamble that are haunted as well. But I would love to start with the Walker Ames house. It's huge, number one. And it's sitting there empty right now? Yes, yes. Does somebody own it or is it falling into disrepair the or the, the company? This, the company owns okay. it. And um, after nobody's lived in there since 1995. And the few years after that, there wasn't um, fireplaces where, you know, nobody was using the fireplaces. There wasn't heat in there or at least efficient heat. And so it kind of fell into a little bit of a disarray inside. And so there's no certificate of occupancy. So it's it's there. We have the most access to it uh, to research the paranormal there. And there's a lot to be had. So Can you start um, with yeah. the history of the house, like when it was built, who yeah. lived there, who might have built the house, whatever you know about it? Yeah, I can give you a, a good snapshot here. So the house was built in 1888. Uh, finished in 1889, and the plans for the house, the design, came from a modern Scientific American magazine out of New York in 1886. So the original house that looks like this one is built in Orange, New Jersey. And what they did here is they flipped it 180 on the house. But uh, it's definitely the most ornate home that's in Port Gamble. It stood over the sawmill. And kind of overlooked the sawmill. And it was built for William Walker and his wife, Emma, and their daughter, Maud. And uh, William Walker was part of a prominent family in town. He was the master mechanic for the sawmill. Um, he would light the fireworks every 4th of July. Um, Emma Walker they had, was known to have had uh, Victorian parties in the home, you know, with the big hats and uh, fancy dresses and, you know, very formal parties. Um, in 1889, their daughter, Maud Walker, married the town manager, Edwin Ames. And he's, I believe, one of the longest tenured managers in the company history here. And so they all lived there in this house together for 11 years until 1900. That's how it gets its name, Walker Ames House. And in 1900, Edwin Ames and Maud Walker decided the house was too passe for their style. <laughs> So they moved out and built a new home, huge house that right in front of the Walker Ames house. <laughs> and they lived there until 1925. Uh, I think the Walkers left around 1910 ish. Um, we know another mill manager who bought the company in 1925, Charles McCormick, uh, who was a member, he's part of the Rockefeller family. He owned the town and the mill in the 20s into the 30s. So he lived there. Um, the Depression ended up taking him out of here, um, and then it was uh, the most expensive place to rent in town oh, after bet. that. And uh, the last family moved out in 1995 when the sawmill closed. So the sawmill here ran for 142 years. It's the longest-running sawmill in U.S. history. 
It's so interesting when you talk about everything, like just in the story of that house, how everything is so interconnected. So it's the people who you work with are also the people you're socializing with and the people that you're trying to impress with your fancy house are your coworkers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I believe the house was positioned where it is for uh, business purposes. You know, if you got investors coming into this mill town and you've got this mansion like this overlooking the, the bustling mill and the bustling town, you're probably going to have an easier time getting someone's business or getting them to invest, mm-hmm. you know, because they're like, it's, it was almost like a status symbol. Right. When are the first hauntings? When did people start? Or, or do you even know? I have an idea. Uh, well, we know for sure investigations started, I believe, in tw- 2003. And it, it's so funny how it started. We had a crew trying to put an HVAC system in there. This is before my time in the town, but... Uh, so there were contractors putting in an, a new heating system to try and save the house a little bit. And they kept reporting all kinds of weird things to the town manager. And then um, we've lost contractors over the years because they, they have an experience and then they don't want to work out here. So that sort of situation was going on at the Walker Ames house and a paranormal team from the Seattle side of Puget Sound happened to have given her a card at one point said, if you ever would let us come investigate, that would be really cool. And so then she called this team in, and I think it was 2003 when the first paranormal investigations were conducted there. And um, it's been going ever since. And so I think um, now I know that one of the people, last people to live in the home, one of the last families, and he would always tell me there's nothing going on in that house. And he was in there for a long time. And then I would just start asking him about the different floors and, oh, well, we didn't, we didn't ever really go there. We didn't like to, or we never went into the basement unless we were made to go into the basement. And, oh, why is that? I don't know. It just didn't feel right. So then he would start to admit that, well, half of the house, two of the four floors, he didn't like going in because it didn't feel right. So there's nothing going on there, huh? <laughs> right. When I was... Looking up the Walker Ames house, I was just looking for haunted houses, just some places I thought would make an interesting episode because I Mm -hmm. love talking about older homes that are haunted and older buildings and places that are haunted. They said it's one of the most haunted houses in the country. Now, I don't know how you judge anything like that. I I suppose anybody could hang that on the front of their, their haunted house and say, hey, it's one of the most haunted in the country. But... Everything I've read about it, people agree this is a very haunted house. Yes. And we have never claimed that for that house. Okay. We've never said, we've never claimed. Well, you know what you read on the internet? It's always true, I know. Pete. <laughs> we've never, and I'll tell you what, the, the paranormal community up in the Pacific Northwest is is really good. It's really, teams like to share information and all that kind of stuff. So, um we've tried to do everything as make it as credible as possible. So we've never like claimed, Oh, we're the most haunted in the country or anything like that. But a lot of really good paranormal research is takes place here. And uh, it's something that I'm really, I think is cool and I'm proud of. And so we, we're always trying to make it as credible as possible. Well, and it's rather than just say something that you can't back it up. You guys have gone in and done yeah. a lot of investigations. Yes. And yeah. Have you done several in that house? So I've I've tried to add up times on tours because we do investigate as we go through on the tours. My public investigations, team investigations, you know, I over the years I think I've spent well over a thousand hours in there. Wow. Over since twenty eleven. So I've been in there a lot. <laughs> I'm really familiar with it. Almost, I guess, too familiar, (laughs) I feel like sometimes. So, yeah, I've done a lot there. You can go in and take tours like somebody. We we keep it locked. Okay. It's, you know, it's not the safest everywhere in there. And so we do keep it locked. But I, you know, we go in there on the ghost walk tours or if there's like a historic walking tour. But those are all scheduled like ticketed events. 
what are some of the things that you've encountered in this house? Or what are, are some of the things as well that you've heard about? Yeah. You know, maybe so, some of the hauntings in the home. Yeah. I've experienced a lot of different things. Um, I've heard from other teams you know, when they report back from an investigation. Just about every kind of experience you can have has been reported in there myself. The only thing is I haven't been like pushed Thankfully, I'll knock on wood for that one. I haven't been scratched either, which is good. Good. I'll take that. <laughs> but I've seen full body and apparition. I've run into something that was not visible, like a person that knocked me backwards. It wasn't a push. I ran into something, seen shadows, heard footsteps, heard voices, seen a pair of red eyes in there at one point staring at me there's a lot of different kinds of things in the basement of the house women and especially blonde women seem to have the most experiences down there um like their hair getting pulled i've i've seen finally in 2022 it yeah, was it last year beginning of 2022 i actually first finally got to witness a woman's hair being lifted up off of her head mm -hmm. and pulled disembodied conversations like back and forth <laughs> yeah there's a, so much a lot of feelings there's a the house is really empaths can kind of have a rough time in there sometimes if they're not careful how open they are because there's a lot of feelings and emotions in the house as well so feelings on up to catching stuff on camera um yeah it's the whole gambit there <laughs> do you have any idea of why this house is so haunted or maybe some of the spirits that are in the house. Some of them may have staked their livelihood on everything, you know, staked everything in their life on the company. I think the land here, uh, there's a Native American history here. Um, and I think there's something to do with the land here and the land being blessed. It feels You'll hear a lot of people talk about it just feels different here. There's a different energy. I mean, there's could be a myriad of reasons, but I think it's partial environment and partially people loved being here. From, from most mm -hmm. accounts, people who worked here, they loved being here. And so I think they just don't want to leave. You did say there's a lot of emotion in the house. Do you feel it's mm -hmm. negative or is it kind of balanced? There's... It's not all negative there. There's a little balance, maybe. It's it's pretty balanced because you can go from feeling real heavy, you know, heavy weight on your chest to bouncing off the walls, just changing floors. So it's 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 very well balanced in there, I would say. So tell me about some of the nights you've gone on because I gone in there because I do think I might have a clip or two that you sent me or at least one. Yeah. But let's talk yeah. about so, some of the experiences that you've had while you're investigating the home. Yeah. And some of the things that you've documented. So, uh, a team I used to be on, Olympic Peninsula Paranormal Society or Team Ops, like to do a lot of experimenting and trying out and using um, uh, with testing out with the ghost box and using frequencies ITC. I'm, I'm going to have you play a clip too. And I'll just kind of set it up that normally during a ghost box session, if if I'm doing one, um, I'll try and like set rules beforehand of how to answer so that we know we're talking to somebody and not just coincidental. And so I always will encourage things to say yes or no, but also say my name along with it so that I know you're talking to me. So I usually phrase a question, you know, hey, I'm looking for a yes, Pete, or a no, Pete answer. And um, so in this clip, we're on the second floor. Uh, I believe it was in uh, the room that right off the master bedroom. Um, but go ahead and play it, and then you'll be able to hear it. Okay, and I can play it more than We can play it a couple times so people can yeah, really hear good. it. I'm going to turn down this music. Did you live across the street? Yes, Pete. Oh, you heard it right there. Yes, Pete. Yeah, so right, I think that right came here, to... Right here, right here. Oh, yeah, I and I believe that came through the ghost box on that one. But it was a good example of 
following the rules <laughs> of of using the ghost box and how to communicate. Yeah, I mean it's pretty clear. Um, yeah, I'm gonna play I one guess, more time. That yes, yeah, yeah, I'll play the whole thing. Yeah. It's so fast. Did you live across the street? Because you say, did you live across the street? And it says, yes, Pete. Yes. Did you live but I, across the street? Ooh, that's very clear. Yeah, oh, and that I, but gives I was, me I was, yeah. The the question was for a young spirit in the house, and it was a young female spirit I was trying to communicate with, and a male answered. <laughs> so I didn't quite know how to take that. It definitely uh, sounded male, didn't it? It does sound male. It's definitely not like a young female. And, and another one I want to play is from a uh, not that same session, but a session later that same night, and you'll just hear. The, you'll hear the ghost box going, you know, the static, and then a voice comes through and I reacted to it because I heard it. And I think if you just play it, you'll, you'll hear what it says. Which clip is it? This is going to be clip number three. Here it is. Hello. You hear that? I'm going to play it again. It's kind of cutting out on uh -huh. my end, but what do you think it says? I can, I can hear you say hello. Did you hear that? So there's there should be a voice right before right that. Before, and that's this. I can't tell what it says, but it sounds like almost sounds like a child. Right. That's who I was trying to communicate with on the last clip that you played was this voice. And it sounds like she says, "Hey there." Oh yeah, like, "Hey there." Oh. But it definitely sounds like a kid voice. Oh, that's yes. interesting. Yeah, that, that's a very common voice that is captured in the house, is that one. And there's no kids there. No, there were no know? children with us. <laughs> <laughs> we don't take children. I don't even take, you know, you got to be 16 or older to go on the ghost walk or the investigation. That was during a team investigation, though. So um, th that's a very common, common voice. And, and just to get to who this is, if we go to clip five, I'll set that up as well. Same floor, different area on the second floor of the Walker Ames house. One of us heard a voice from the team downstairs. And so that kind of prompted us to, hey, let's go up on the second floor. And what you'll hear, so two members of the team, I think, went back on the opposite corner of the second floor and started a ghost box session. So you'll hear kind of an R2-D2 type sound in there, and that's the ghost box. But we were asking, okay, we, you know, we heard you downstairs. Who are you? You know, standard questions, you know, tell us who you are. And then uh, we captured clip number five, and you'll hear one of my teammates repeat what we all heard. It was a di definitely a disembodied voice. A lady. A lady. So there's a voice, and then you'll hear my teammate. A lady. Repeat. Yeah, right there you hear. Yeah, go ahead and play it again. Sorry. A lady. A lady. We think it says a lady. A lady. Oh, and also sounds like a child. I think it's the same voice from the Hey There clip that we played. It does sound like Hey Lady. Yes, a lady. And, and it's interesting because in other teams have captured over the years the voice of an older sounding woman who says she's the lady. Um, oh. Now, so now... We're at, we were saying, okay, who's who's the lady? <laughs> What's the lady's name? And we captured clip number six here. Annabelle. Annabelle. It sounds like a little kid saying Annabelle. Yep. That's the voice that we were looking for. <laughs> <laughs> that is crazy. I don't know what else that would be. You know, if you try to debunk something, you're sitting in a house. And it, when yep. you're doing paranormal investigations, it's quiet. It's not like y'all are making a bunch of noise. You didn't bring the kids with you that night. I'm going to play it one more time. 
what is that? Like if you're trying to debunk <laughs> something, how do you? Right. And all team members were accounted for. Uh, there was, a, I think, a, at least six of us in this hallway and we, everybody heard it. There was no way. It, it was just plain as day. From where I was standing, I was closest to the stair railing, you know, looking over down the main staircase. And the voice seemed to emanate from like right next to me is, is where it sounded like it came from. And there was a blast of energy as well. Every time she spoke, it felt like, you know, a million butterflies going right through your body every time she spoke. Really? Um, yeah. Oh, it was really intense. <laughs> you know, I always tell people. Um, if you've ever stood near power lines or a big like power substation or a transformer, if it made you feel a certain way, tingly or nauseous or, you know, uh, if like butterflies in your guts, you know, if you've ever felt that, that's how you're going to most likely feel spirit energy as well. So we were definitely getting hits of that with these uh, disembodied voices. It's so crazy when you're there, do you feel, but you don't feel threatened. Or do you yeah. ever kind of feel that when you're there? I mean, I have. Okay. I have in the past, but that situation, no. I don't usually don't feel scared in the house unless I'm in there by myself late at night, which is not really a good any idea anyways. Right. You know, and that's when your mind gets a hold of you. So I have felt unwelcome and I have felt scared in there, but only a couple of times. Most of the time I, I feel comfortable I always remind them that I'm the town manager. <laughs> so they, <laughs> you know, hey, I am they're somebody. Nice. They're nice. They're, and I've always tried to, uh, we have a couple spaces in the house we don't allow anybody to go into. We don't allow filming devices, you know, in these areas um, that they're for this, they're for the long-term residents, their place for them to go and not be bothered. And we've done that. I carried have carried that tradition forward. It started in 2003. And I think it's really helped with the spirits there, you know, going in with respect. I think mm -hmm. they give respect mm -hmm. back and they will communicate. Seems like they're more willing to communicate because of how, you know, we try and approach it there. And I've had numerous teams over the past few years get my name on their audios of, of someone asking, where's Pete? Really? Where's Pete? Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. one consistent thing I've found talking to so many different people who are professionals in the paranormal world is that you really need to approach the spirits with respect and they'll give it back to you. Right. But not to taunt them. It's not a taunting thing. It's not trying to stir up something. It's not trying to get them to engage. It's asking them to, but mm -hmm. not trying to do it in a, in yeah. a mean-spirited way. Yeah. One thing I'm real big on and talk about on the tours is to remember that ghosts were people once too, just like us. And so you wouldn't go into a, a Walmart or something or some big store and start, you know, antagonizing people randomly. Right. That's not what you do. Although so you should, that does happen should, and it never it goes does over happen. well. It does happen. But when you're approaching the paranormal, if you know, think about it like that. Yeah. You get back what you put out there for sure. Now, as far as the Walker Ames house goes, is, are there any other clips that you wanted to play from there? Yeah. So I think if we do um, clip 14, there's a little bit of a lead in here. Uh, a friend of mine who's an audio engineer guy, he comes on the tours every once in a while. So we set up a microphone on the main staircase uh, in the Walker Ames house before the tour. The tour doesn't even start there. It ends there at the Walker Ames house. So we set the microphone up and then locked the house and went to go greet people to get everybody checked in for the tour. Based on the time stamping of this, what the clip you're going to hear here is about 13 minutes after we leave. So the tour would just even be barely starting at that point and none of us are at the location. And But we were able to capture these sounds. Oh my goodness. I'm going to play that again. Yeah. So that came from an empty part of the house? Because it's the whole house like was empty. The whole, the whole house is empty. And what the heck is that? We're not even there. 
Right. So there's exactly. nobody <laughs> inside the house, and this is happening. I'm playing it one more time. And it sounds like doors are shutting and cupboards are shutting and people are stomping. I don't know what all that is. There is a door near the location where the microphone was. But if you open that door, it's a little vestibule room. And then you have a few feet before the actual front door of the house, which we never open. It's always locked. We never open that one. And so the only way somebody could have got in was from... The street side, which is the back of the house, and you clearly, you know, scrutinizing this on either end of the the audio, there was nobody nobody opening the kitchen door where you come in. That's a very peculiar sound. There was none of that. There was no footsteps leading up to in that room. So it's definitely an unexplained occurrence, but it's pretty loud. (laughs) And that wraps up part one of our conversation about the hauntings of Port Gamble, Washington with Paranormal Pete. You can get more information about Pete at portgambleparanormal.com and listen to his Paranormal Pete show at wlktdb.com. If you like access to all of our episodes, including the archive and advance episodes, everything commercial free, become a gravekeeper. Sign up on Apple Podcasts. You can try it there for three days free. See if you like it. You can also go to patreon.com slash the grave talks and find everything there. Also, all ad free. For all of us at the Grave Talks, I'm Carol Hughes. Thank you for listening.